Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Picture Discussions. Today I'm joined by Jason Abrams. Jason is a writer, director, actor who released his debut feature back in April. It's called Hungry Dog Blues. It's a uh, crime thriller set in the state of Missouri. It's very good. I've known Jason for 10 years and I really enjoyed this discussion. I enjoyed catching up with him and talking, uh, directing, and producing independent features. I hope you enjoy. Jason, thank you so much for joining me here. Uh, it's, it's good to see you, it's good to talk. You and I were just talking off camera about creativity and capturing creativity when it strikes and also not putting pressure on yourself, creating meaning around, you know, creativity. So why don't you jump back into what we were just talking about? Yeah, so the, the idea that was actually brought, brought to me by uh, Peter uh, Shrump, our mutual friend, was I was talking about basically that like, the frustration of wanting to create things and make stuff, especially in film and as like a filmmaker, but feeling so hamstrung by, you know, money, industry, stars, like all of these things that you need to put together to finance like a feature film. And, you know, just kind of my inherent jealousy of a musician who can sit down and just be like, I'm going to play music. I'm going to write a song and being able to do that. You know, and, and not having all these mechanisms that are keeping you from practicing your craft. And and something that he was like saying was like, well, why don't you just like, you know, create shorts or whatever and, you know, put them on YouTube and do these things. And like, I, I kind of sneered at the idea of like, eh, you know, I don't know if that's really what I, you know, like I make feature films now. Like, I don't, I don't make YouTube videos like that's that's it's beneath me. <laughs> you know, in, in this like totally pompous way, but yeah, I, I kind of like related it to like I was like I really want to be able to make films on the scale and size that I dream of, and that I hope to be able to continue making, you know, for the rest of my life. And like, you know, there's just a lot of bells and whistles that go along with that of creating something that feels and looks and is like a feature film, like a movie. And the thing that he said to me that blew my mind was he was like, that's all well and good. And there's a place and a time for that. But like, what if all of that need for production value is you needing to protect yourself from feeling like you're not enough. Mm. That, that just all of that stuff is uh, insulation. Insulation. Yeah. To, 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 to like, if I took that all away, you would see that, I'm not actually good at this or, or that I'm not actually a good filmmaker. I'm not a good director that my writing's not good or, or whatever. Yeah. Like, are you, are you hiding with all of those layers right. um, to protect yourself? And you're actually just saying that you need all that stuff right. to feel safe, to create, to, to, to do that. And that there's this other space that's actually totally acceptable to like strip all those things back and just shoot a story quick a minute or two, three, you know, of telling a story visually with a camera. Right. You know, and, and I just like, that's not the end goal of what I want for my career, but to say that that's not a viable use of time right. and energy and effort in between these giant, you know, cataclysmic kind of, you know, projects that we do is is would be completely wrong like that that's true that like they're like that's important and that's a you know the thing that also really kind of inspired me about that was you know um soderbergh recut um raiders of the lost ark oh, um i didn't hear about this and, and, yes he did like he he recut it and he took out all the sound and he turned it black and white and just uses like trent reznor score over it purely as an exercise in staging blocking composition editing just to like use this like perfectly shot story yeah and see like can i tell this story without needing all the bells and whistles not even having to go out and shoot it right. you know obviously he's using raiders of the lost ark so like 
he's using some pretty decent material to start with. That's some good clay, you know? Yeah. But like that, if this guy is out there in his free time exercising and pushing himself in his craft to really understand what he does, like, why am I not doing that? Like, why am I not exercising the craft of like, uh, you know, I, I'm an NBA fan and I've watched a lot of NBA but I have a terrible jump shot. I can't make a layup because I've never taken any. I've, I've like, I'd never go play basketball and really ever. Yeah. And it's like, you can think about it and dream about it and watch it all you want. But if you're not practicing the thing, if you're not shooting free throws, you're going to suck at free throws. Like, or you're yeah. just, you're certainly not going to get any better than you are right now. Right. right. And like finding ways as filmmakers to do that in a way yeah. that feels constructive. Right. I think is really, really important. It doesn't mean you need to go out and shoot a, a, a short film on your iPhone every week. You know, I don't know what it means for everybody, but it was just an interesting idea that I really realized, like, and it made me think about my own feature of like, huh, yeah. like how much of that was insulation? How much of that was necessary? You know? And, and, and I think like you understand this you know, better than anyone having made a low budget feature that like, you're required to strip so much of what you wanted in terms of production value away from the film mm. that like you have to get really clear about what it is you're making yeah, because you can't do everything that you want to do. You know, the, the exercise kind of is, is equally a, a applicable to no matter what the thing that you're making is, as long as you're not like Christopher Nolan and have like unlimited money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and cause I have a lot of thoughts based on that very um i think like i think you covered so much that that really speaks to you know what independent filmmakers struggle with like th th that are tortured with every day you know without sort of having a an entry to resources or or this vast network of agents producers talent you know the whole nine yards right and I'm sure for Christopher Nolan, it doesn't feel like insulation. He's on such a level where he's yeah. continuously like, look at Oppenheimer. I just saw it, you know, last Friday. And that seemed like from where he was with Dunkirk, this is like even beyond that. Right. So it's like, so I guess to, to parse out, I see both sides of it. You know, I see how, right. you know, you know, feeling like, oh, you know, that snobbery or, or purist sense of what being a filmmaker you can easily fall into it right being like i need right. these things before i can i'm only shooting act. on 35 right right i'm only shooting on 35 uh, that's who i am or, i'm a 35 guy that's all i do yeah or i need you know i need an additional editor i can't edit it myself you know i'm not going to engage with my own footage right. you know there's so many different you know things you can bring up but there's constraints. There's so many constraints. And I think when you put the constraints of I need to tell a 90 minute story and you immediately start, you know, being inspired by your influences or people that, you know, when you sit in a theater and you feel things right when you watch a Nolan film or you watch a Scorsese film, um, you know, any any director, Sam Mendes film, you something in you gets pulled toward the screen that, that wants to engage with with the format on that level right so i think it's it's something to aspire to but you're right i think also you know when you haven't taken the jump just the simple jump shots or the free or the free throws when you haven't spent your time on the free throw line um i think that's there's an opportunity there as well and you know to what you were saying carrying around an iphone there's always an opportunity there you know i think at times you have to be a very disciplined person to keep that in mind and also find opportunities in ways that might not feel um satisf satisfying <laughs> you know in terms of making a film um but there's always an opportunity to to exercise like you said to get in the weight room or the laboratory whatever analogy you want to use and and yeah. just create you know and and who knows that hour you spent at the park when you're taking out your iPhone to, you know, see the, you know, experiment with light coming through leaves and branches, you know, maybe that hour spent shows up later, you know, on set when you're doing your $50 million film. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Right. There's different, different I, choices, different decisions to make. 
And the the thing that to like come back to like the kind of NBA analogy, which that like um, is so many players talk about like when you hit the league, you know, that it's just different. It's a, the game is a different speed. The players are at a different level. Everything's different and it takes some time. You need to play the game at that level. No matter how much time you spend in the gym shooting free throws, mm. you have to play at that level to get to that, to be able to do that, you know? And I think it's applicable every step of the way. They're still in the gym shooting free throws, yeah. still hitting their jump shots, still working on their own fundamentals. But, like, you also have to play the game at the top level yeah. to be it. Like you, like, you can't just stay there forever and, and do that. Like, you have to, like, like you did, you know, take this giant leap, push yourself into that next level, make a feature, make it for whatever money that you can, you know, because no one's ever going to give you the opportunity for that $50 million movie, most likely, unless you have taken that first step yeah. of pushing yourself into the league. Yeah, you know, yeah. of 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 doing that. So it's it's kind of like you said, it's it's kind of both and, you know, of, in a certain way of that. Like you should have this creative freedom to create wherever you are using whatever you have, mm -hmm. and and not feel like you need it to be this big thing. Right. But you will never be able to be ready to do the bigger things unless you start doing bigger things. You know, like yeah. it's so it's it's so it's so funny that way that it's like you know, because of my experience making a feature film at such a small level, but, you know, having a bigger, uh, <laughs> hold please. That was a nice, uh, uh technology tilt, tilt, tilt pan move right there. <laughs> this, this, no, this guy just freaking absolutely died. <laughs> hold please. Hold please. For technical difficulties. Hold, um, for hold for camera. Back in, back in action. Um, yeah. So, to, to, to like, to, yeah, to go back to like making a film at our level, like I'd never made a film at that size or scale before. Obviously I'd never made a feature before. And, and I think so many of those lessons that we learned are what makes the next one better. And, and yeah. if you would have skipped that first step, I don't know. I mean, I can tell you, like, like you said about Christopher Nolan, like if someone handed me the Oppenheimer script and handed me $200 million and was like, Okay, I, we need it next July. <laughs> Good luck. I, you know, I, I mean, sure. Would I, would I be able to do some semblance of it? Sure, but I'm not Christopher Nolan. I haven't made six films in IMAX. Yeah, you I know? mean, think like about that, the films that, that that were his stepping stones to get to to Oppenheimer. It was right. it was insane. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, have you ever seen the following? Have you ever seen his first feature? I did. Yeah, I actually saw. Uh, I think it was a print at the Egyptian uh, on Hollywood Boulevard, and he did a Q and A after, and that was really cool. Wow. Yeah. That, I mean, I'll be honest, and and hopefully he doesn't hear me and then hate me and never <laughs> want to work with me again. But like, again, like we've worked together. But like, it's not that good. <laughs> like, no, it's not it's, very good. Like it's yeah, yeah. it's a totally normal first feature that's like yeah. has some good parts yeah. has some not some good, good parts the production value is kind of mm, like right. there's there's choices being made that i would think that he probably looked back at now and rolled his eyes at you know yeah and totally. it's like i think it's a good but, example like, though because it's not to and i agree with you it's not it's not there's nothing that separates that film or or gives you like a standout like that's a christopher nolan film there's nothing really inventive or clever tr like truly clever about it it's it's interesting it's um i think it i think what it has are certain signatures dna strands in it that when you watch memento right. and you watch the dark knight you know those those ideas or those concepts that he was starting to play with you know blossomed in those later films and that you know makes you think of like for hungry dog blues and neon bleed you know these are what we did were, was give ourselves first put a crucible around ourselves to get a feature film done to aspire to a, a certain level of, of executing a feature film and then bake into right. that certain signatures that we're interested in exploring in a visual yeah. way right that we obviously when yeah. we get to the three million dollar film the ten million dollar film the fifty million dollar film are going to you know fully blossom hopefully we'll, we'll have had the chances those stepping stone 
opportunities to, you know, let, let things unfurl. You know, I think that's sort of the artistic journey. I was talking to Spencer about that. It's like, I don't view, and I know we've talked about this too offline. You know, we've, we've talked about the difference between like, obviously, you know, making a living, it's important to make a living, you know, support yourself and your family. But I view film as like so much more of a, a sacred protected process that I could never imagine just like cranking out Avengers films or even A24 films, because that's like a thing now too. It's like a franchise around A24 films, but I could never just do that. You know, you know what I mean? Like, like if someone held a gun to my head and said, you have to make a $5 million film once every eight months or 12 months, even that sort of structure around it would make me feel like, no, that just isn't how I, I gave Spencer the, you know, the idea that I, I think I had for at least three years is like, I want to feel hungry coming out of a project. I want to feel propelled from one project to the next, you know, this idea that these mm -hmm. big creative endeavors have seasons and cycles within them. And, you know, you have to let the storm kind of come through this, this massive creative storm happened to you. And on the other mm -hmm. side, you might be completely exhausted, but you know, you're inspired, you should be inspired to a certain degree to go figure out what's next after that. And that's not always going to be linear. It's not always going to be like, okay, there's my $120,000 salary, you know, clocking in and make, making sure I'm, you know, covering my, uh, my salary every year. I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. Just, just to your point of, of different scales and, and creative endeavors, I would, you know, I would never want to, you know, feel like I was doing a film for any other reason, just, just that I was a hundred percent stimulated, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I, I agree. And I, I see what you're saying and I slightly disagree of this, that like sometimes, sometimes when you have to do it, you do your best work. You know, some, mm -hmm. some of my favorite Scorsese movies, like Color of Money, is like, that was a paycheck job for him. Oh, right. And like, and like, he just wanted to get a hit. And like, so he tries all these crazy things and does all these, like, all this stuff because he doesn't really feel the stakes of it being one of his big endeavors. He's just like, ah, I'm just doing this. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, I think that sense of, of openness is good too. Like, you know, I, I think if, if you got to the place where, where people are, listen, there's a balance, right? The one for you, one for them. Right. right. Like, and maybe it doesn't need to be one-to-one. -one. Like, you know, that's just how the saying goes. But like, I, I think it works both ways of that. Like, listen, if A24 or Marvel or whoever, you know, Marvel's kind of a different story now because they're a different machine. Like Marvel of 10 years ago, maybe like, <laughs> you know, came to you or came to, I'll speak for myself, came to me and was like, Hey, we want you to do this thing. Sure. That sounds great. I'll yeah. do whatever you want. Just yeah. pay me. Yeah. Like I'm getting paid to make movies and probably like a lot of money. I'm like, that sounds awesome. That yeah. sounds great to be paid to do what I want to do. And like, I'm sure I'll still try and do cool things because I want to make the best movies possible. Right. The, I don't see a world where you would phone it in. Maybe if you did six in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, for sure. Then, then, then you're probably, you know, losing sight of why you're doing it. Yeah. But, well, it's the great question you know, of, I, of art and, and business and that tension. And I think that tension is necessary that both entities are there, you know, they, they fuel each other. And I think that can take place within, you know, one's personal experience of, of like the one for you, one for them. Right. Um, but it, it's yeah. just interesting because I, I do agree. I think like people can slip pretty easily and it's tough it's really tough to you know once marvel starts throwing money at you or a24 starts throwing money at you um although they you know would look like different things i think it, it's tempting <laughs> like once you you know build a network within you know the marvel studios or net at netflix or whatever um one has to be careful if if their priorities are you know some sort of like individual authenticity um Again, not yeah. to be snobby. I'll be honest. It's, it's I, I take the thing. money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I take the money. Fair. Right now in my life, I take the money. I would take, I take it. it. I, I would I take I would, it. I would take it too right now too. That, that's like. That's what I'm saying. Like, who, it's who like, it depends where you are and, and you're. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. If they came knocking, you'd be like, yes, absolutely. Whatever you want me to make. 
Yeah. What whatever it is that you want me to make, unless it was truly something that you were like, I don't think I would do a good job at this, and it would probably be detrimental. Right. You know what I mean? Whatever signals that that you were getting from that project is like, I'm gonna fuck this up. (laughs) Like, yeah, yeah. Like if they came, if someone came to me and was like, "Do you want to make the new Exorcist movie or whatever?" Which I saw the trailer for when I saw Oppenheimer and it looked horrifying. Yeah, look. I was like, I would be like. (laughs) I, oh no, I'm not a horror person. I'm totally a wuss. Yeah. I, if it, they came to me and was like, "We want you to make this exorcism movie," I'd be like, "Do they have problems with their mom? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, 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 how am I supposed to? I don't know what my connection point to that is. It's not my jam. So, right. like, right. I feel like I would be like, I would love to make a very expensive movie for you, yeah. but well, I have that's just that is totally like- outside of my genre." Yeah, 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 exactly. It's just knowing your limits. Is someone pulling a small scale bank heist in this exorcism movie? Because if so, I can totally help you. But yeah. otherwise, like, yeah. I don't know what I'm gonna do there. Like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't even know in, in, in the slightest. No, I agree. No, these are these are fun thought experiments. I think they're really important because you, you know there are. I'm actually working on a script right now with someone, uh, a buddy of mine, and he's more in like the finance business side of the industry. And, and he's sort of dictating the pace and the process of this script. I feel like a hired gun. This doesn't very much doesn't feel like my project. It, it does in a lot of ways. Like I'm definitely invested in the idea, but the way this script is going to go out is it's going to be off my table. You know, it's going to be, you know, sort of a joint project. And um, so that's, I'm definitely sort of putting that constraint around it and it'll be interesting to see what happens with that script if anything um but i'm not you know uh, i won't turn down you know a quarter of a million dollar paycheck for a script that's <laughs> it's like yeah, that's much or, or money literally right anything <laughs> yeah. yeah like literally anything. anything that you want me to do yeah i will do it i would at this, at this point if they're like exorcism movie i'd be like you got it. <laughs> like, like you got it. What do you want me to do? Like Excuse me. <laughs> if anything, anything that's going to put food on my table. I mean, I mean, just to keep it a hundred, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. yeah, I just would rather be working, making money than not at this point. And like, whatever that means. Right. You know, and, and, but kind of coming back to your original point of like, that this is a lifelong journey. Yeah. Right. It, 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 it is, it is an artistic journey over a lifetime. And, you know, would I take literally any paying job right now? Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I'm satisfied by that. And I'm not going to keep my eye on the ball of the next feature that I want to make. Right. You know, it's, it's just like, I, I, I think like, it's really hard to, and I'll speak for myself. It's really hard to maintain realism and idealism in both hands. Totally. You know, to be, to, to be real with yourself and to be like, I, I'm just, I just want to work. I want to make money. I want to, you know, be able to provide for my family. I want to have a, a somewhat decent lifestyle where I'm not thinking about how to buy groceries, yeah. you know, like just, just basic stuff. And then also I want to achieve my dreams. You know, I, I want to get to the place that I want to get to. I want to, be able to make this things that I want to make and you got to hold both of those things in your hands simultaneously. You know, you you can't let go of one, you know, for the other, you just, you just, neither one will get you to where you want. Yeah. And I I think it is like, that is the, the creative path or like the true artist path. It's not all art all the time. It is, um, it's a synthesis, you know, life is a synthesis of many different things. And I think that's, that's what's to be celebrated about it. You know, look at what you and I are doing, you know, our, our day jobs and, and creative jobs all rolled into one. It's unique. It's unique. You know, it's your experience. It's my experience. This is our path. And, you know, I, I look at the jobs I do in videography and, and editing as that sort of cross disciplinary thing for film and in, in a, in a divorced way, completely from film at the same time. And there is some sort of, I don't know, it is, I, I think I am lucky at this stage to be able to do that, to be able to work some sort of job that's completely mercenary and, and divorced of, you know, so much like personal creative investment all the time. So it's, I, I think it's, yeah, it's just, it's, it's all life, right. <laughs> it's, 
And it is like a you're, tanker, not a rowboat. You know, you're not going to make these sharp turns into um, at times they might feel that way. But what you were building to all the time is this, you know, sort of slow buildup of energy that delivers you at some sort of, you know, closer and closer to the synthesis of dreams and reality. Right. That's that's the hope, I think. Yeah, that's a that's a really good way to put it. Is that it, for what for better or for worse, it does feel like a very large boat that moves very slowly, <laughs> but it's carrying a lot of weight and precious cargo. That's right. You That's know, right. And keep like, it in perspective. You feel it. You you feel like, gosh, if I can just bring this thing into harbor, you know, if I can just get this thing. Yeah. Like everyone will see all the great stuff that I'm carrying on it, you know. Like, oh man, just just nobody knows it because I'm out in the middle of the freaking ocean alone. <laughs> like, and I hope there's no like that. that <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm just like, how do I make sure that like I'm able to bring this thing in so everybody can see what I have? But like, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a it's a long journey, and like, I don't know. I mean, to to bring it back to your own film with Neon Bleed, you know, like. You know, your film, you released it, what, four months ago now? Because that well, it was the end months? of January, so it was about five months, almost six months. Six? Six? Yeah. So you're six months out now. Yeah. And, you know, do you feel differently about it now than you did when you released it? I guess in what in what sense? Just as as a product of something that you made, yeah, yeah, you know, or no, or, or in all senses, you know, in a right. business, not you know, in a business sense, in your career, but also as a, as an artist, as a creator, you know, do you yeah. now that it's been out and you're not really having to think about it on that kind of daily basis? Yeah. I, I assume, yeah, you know, that that like, you know, how does it change your perspective? about what you want to do next or, or, you know, or what it was that you did, you know, I'm just curious, like what a little bit of distance has done for your feelings about the whole process. Yeah. Well, wow, this is like a loaded question. There's, you know, you ask these really good questions and y- your responses are very loaded too. I get all these ideas that sort of spider web when you, <laughs> you when you yes, talk. Well, Jason. you should you should speak to my wife. She <laughs> often will say like, "I would like it if you did no, a monologue so I can respond to all the things that you say in order." Because yeah, by the time I, I finish I, talking, she's like, "I don't remember anything." Because it's got to be maddening. Just you know, every everything you say, it's like I have so many thoughts. How could I get through a day like that? No, I'm just I'm joking. Um, it's a it's a good problem to have. Um, back to your question. Um, so I haven't seen Neon Bleed. I don't I don't know the last time I watched. I think it was probably at it was probably at the Chandler Film Festival at the end of January, which is when the film released too on Voodoo. So I don't think I've seen it start to finish or maybe even more than five minutes since then you didn't watch and, the premiere at the premiere no I, wa- I watched the premiere after the premiere <laughs> okay yeah yeah i think we watched it on voodoo that same weekend once it was out too so yeah so it hasn't been since you know end of january early february and um it's funny and and you let me know if you get the same thing i get these like flashes of like i'm in the editing booth in, in in the middle of a very specific like creative problem and I'll just get that like flashbulb memory or a time on set you know these memories come back really strong and I think you know to to your point of saying how you're so dialed into the weeds when you're going through the process and you know for for both of us being directors and producers right this started in the financing phase and even in pre-production you're so dialed into the budget or, you know, some sort of like coordinating piece you have to do with vendors to make the chairs or the, you know, catering show up on the, you're so dialed into every aspect of this process that, right. You know, and I remember like showing up on day one and being like, I don't know how this is all going to happen. Like there's, there's so much loaded into like 15 days that you're trying to pull off. Right. Um, which again goes back to the idea of like a feature film on the highest scale you can muster, muster truly being like a crucible to to exercise you to eke out every creative problem solving skill that you have, right? That that is you know a huge opportunity, but 
um, I think when you're that close to it, you're, it's almost like you get this sort of like flow state going where you're just kind of there. It's like this out of body experience and you can't really think double think or, um, you know, think in a self-conscious way because the way you're making decisions just has to happen so fast that you're just, you're, you're just kind of surrendering. You're like giving it over to trust, like, okay, whatever decision I make, that's going to be printed yeah. into celluloid and, and that's going to be the thing. Right. I'm just um, like, I literally don't have time to second guess this. Yeah. Yeah. So many yeah. have to forward from this decision right. that like, I have to just decision because nine things have to happen after this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exa exactly. And I think that's like the authorship, you know, to your point of, or, or what we were just discussing about life and creativity, that it's all the same, right? That the authorship is just being present and, and like letting the machine kind of roll over you, right? And, and just being like submitting to it. So I, yeah, it's, it, I, I'm going to have to go back to, I don't know if that answers your question about Neon Bleed and how I feel about it, but um, I'm gonna have to go back and watch it at some point. All I know is the thing like that was such a loaded script. There are so many ideas baked into it. And it was this sort of multi genre, like cross genre film of a music drama with like a Coen Brothers slow burn crime. Um, like even older films, I mentioned, uh, talking to Spencer sweet smell of success, which is like this backstage expose about um, I think it's like the broad. It, yeah, it's the Broadway industry in the 50s and there's all this angling i mean there's there's so many different you know ideas built into that film that uh yeah i i think it's just it's it's really it's really interesting it's um i wanted to ask you about hungry dog blues and where that where that idea came from is that something that had been germinating for a while leading up to this point where you're like okay i'm gonna make my debut feature film and this is what it's going to be uh it's gonna you know it's gonna be a, a small town sort of rural crime thriller yes and no right so like uh i don't know if we talked about this or if you know this but like the origin of the movie was that like my dad got federally indicted and so no i did I not know that yeah yeah so my dad got federally indicted and, um, and he, and he owned a business. It was a small business, but it was his business that he'd owned for most of my life. And, you know, the, the FBI came in and raided his business and was like, it was this whole thing. And, and he was looking at, you know, a significant amount of jail time, um, for, for what the alleged crimes were to be. Um, and we lost, you know, he lost everything in that, in that experience. And it, it really broke him. And, you know, the, the thing that I felt out of that was this overwhelming desire to protect my dad, mm. you know, just, and, and, and so much so that like, I didn't really care about his innocence or guilt. Mm. It, it mm. what mattered was, is that he was my dad and that I wanted to protect him. And, and, it, and that feeling scared the shit out of me that yeah. the realization that I was like, I would do just about anything to protect this person right now. And I would cross every moral line that I have that I would swear I would never cross for myself for my own like selfish desires, but in the justification and the righteousness of protecting someone I love, I would cross all of these lines. And, and I about myself, I knew it was true that if, if I had an opportunity, I would. And that feeling, um, it just stuck with me. And, and, it, and that's ultimately what turned out to be the, the kind of genesis of the story was how far are you willing to go to protect someone you love? And, yeah. and, 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 you know, and the thing with my dad, like, to, like, give the end of that story, which is, you know, just to, to, for context, like, much less dramatic than the movie is, like, it, you know, it ended yeah, up sure. being kind of overblown and, and you know, and, and his innocence or guilt kind of was, it was ambiguous. It, it, was, it was, you know, it was not, was it as bad as what they were trying to say? Absolutely not. But had he maybe crossed some lines that he shouldn't have? Absolutely. 
Yeah. So, yeah. It wasn't so black and white. And that moral ambiguity was the like linchpin to me thematically of just the, mm. how people justify doing what they want is very interesting to me. You know, right. that people tell themselves whatever they need to hear to do what they want. And, yeah. and, and that, that kind of is what it came out of. And then on top of it, you know, I wanted to make a genre movie. I wanted it to have some action elements and some set pieces. And, you know, it just, it just fit in this way that I was like, I can serve this deep, deep, deep feeling that is trying to be expressed. You know, I couldn't yeah. save my dad in real life, but I could make a movie about it. And like, is it this like exonerating, you know, um, film like championing his innocence? Not at all. Not even close. In fact, it ended up exploring kind of a lot more of the complexities about how I feel about my dad mm -hmm. and, and those things. You know, so a lot of it's not one to one, right? A lot of right, it is right. where it needs to go. It's not like no, and I think you you said something really important there, which I think this is sort of what I consider um, being a true artist is taking in all of this information, right, and then intuiting whether that's the right story to tell right and it might not be the factual you know incidents or or chain of events of from something from your experience and i don't think that's that's like you know what do they say is like truth with a capital t is is actually like fiction it's some sort of extract abstracted truth and mm -hmm. we use fiction to get there right um to actually be more authentic um, but that you're using your filmmaker instincts to, you know, heighten the stakes to really portray that feeling that you had that that you yeah. wanted to protect your father, this 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 deep, primal, you know, hardwired feeling. Right. Um, yeah. That that made for a really, I think, a really interesting character. And, and I think you had a great ensemble of characters. That That was one of the things I wanted to ask you is. You know the theme in the war that that theme that you just mentioned this idea of like how far would you go to protect someone someone that you loved and kind of fitting into like sort of like a western um genre outlaw you know not using you know the the legal system uh not not obeying the legal system legal system going outside the bounds to um see justice served right and how how did you because you know and i assume it was in the script as well um but how did you talk to your actors what was that process like of directing even from early conversations i don't know whether you rehearsed or not um but just i guess take me through you know what that was like communicating your vision and the story that you wanted to tell yeah i you know um because i kind of have an acting background um i feel like i almost too harshly expect actors to like bring the juice because that's how I <laughs> from myself you know that like it's my job as an actor to come like juice just like full ready to go totally prepared like totally flexible ready to do whatever needs to be done I'm you know I have my own decisions my own things that I made but I'm also willing to do whatever the director needs me to do you know, you want me to stand on a chair and do the monologue? Great, I can do that. You know, you want me to do it, you know, like, you want me to cut out half the lines? Great, I can do that too. You know, and so, like, I, I think, like, that kind of expectation in a certain way leads me to be actually, like, much more, um, I don't want to say mechanical, but, like, I'm much more interested about the staging and the blocking and like helping people figure out the, and navigate the physical space or giving small amounts of ideas that they can then pull apart and, and do things with, you know? Um, I think for me, like I, we didn't get to rehearse very much at all, but I did have conversations with Amy and CJ and obviously many, 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 many conversations with Irina. Um, you know, that's perks of being married to one of the actors is that you get to talk about it a lot more than they probably want. But um, that like, yeah. I got to have conversations with them um, and just talk about the character, you know, and just yeah. about where 
I see them coming from and hear where they connect to it and, and just continually planting ideas in there. What if, yeah. it, what if that, what about this? What do you think that's like? What do you feel about that? Like, you know, those ideas, I think, germinate in a natural process for an actor that blossoms unconsciously. You know, I, I, you get too um, result oriented uh, emotionally or whatever, you know, I, I think you can put people in their ear heads pretty easily about that. But also, uh, you know, it's, and this is definitely from my uh, like acting background bias is that I'm like, if a director tells you, like, I need you to be more angry here. Like, most actors would be like, that's a bad note. Don't, like, don't give emotional, resulted, oriented notes. You know, it's something that you hear about all the time. I think you should say whatever is true. Yeah, yeah. Say what is true. You need that, let them figure it out. Don't tell them how to do it. Just be like, hey, Mm -hmm. I I need more. I need this to be higher. Right now you're at a seven. I need a 10. Yeah. Yeah. And if they're forcing it and they're pushing it, you know, then maybe try a different method. Like, oh, you're trying this. Well, maybe try it this way, you know, but yeah. like, I don't know. I just don't think that there's, there's only one thing, I guess, that I should say that I think is wrong, which is to manipulate and to mm. fuck with them. Like, don't fuck with them. Be a professional. Right. Like, tell them what you need. Yeah. You know, I need. No, to- I, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. I, and I think different actors have different access points. Obviously people speak different languages and oh. I think knowing how to approach certain personalities, um, you know, like, you know, for neon bleed, we had so many different characters, just different types of characters yeah. that sort of all came together in this, in this piece. And they needed different things. Like the actors who played those characters needed different things and ways of communicating. Some people didn't need anything at all. Some people needed a lot of coddling and, yeah. and focusing. <laughs> and, and just... Communication, you know? And like, yeah, that's, yeah. What did you feel like was the, like, um, the common, like, phrase or the thing that you kept on coming back to in order? Because I feel like there was a couple things that I kept on coming back to that I think ultimately read throughout the whole film that like kept everything together. Was there anything like that, that you felt like you were continually coming back to across the board that you were trying to infuse into the performances? I I think a lot of times, and because it was such a dialogue driven film that, you know, for neon bleed being a dialogue driven film, that there just needed to be this rhythm um, to the dialogue. And a lot of times it was just like, you know, just say it faster right because and yeah just say it faster it's almost like just just say it fast so you're not like thinking about how you're saying it do it yeah just do it yeah yeah so it was it was just getting the actors i think just sort of calibrated like really you would say like in their gut you know because by that point too like we did a little bit of rehearsing and i mean i definitely talked to all the actors about their characters we they had a each actor had a good idea, you know, where their character was coming from before, you know, before the story started. Right. So at that point it was like, we don't need to talk about motivation or backstory or what you should be feeling here. You have an idea about how to do the scene. Now it's just like truly getting you like into your gut, you know, it's like blocking and and making sure you're just, you're there, you know, completely there. So, um, but it was a lot of, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I think it was like, because it was so, it, it was so dialogue driven. It was more theatrical. It was more like a play. Like, you know, a lot of the scenes were more like plays that it felt. And because of the nature of the set and the crew is very intimate, it felt, you know, fun. It felt cool to kind of find that energy and that rhythm, you know, in, in <laughs> under the lines really. So. Did you, did you feel like that there were, um, at least I let me let me rephrase this. I felt like ultimately I found like, certain phrases, certain words meant certain things to certain actors that I could come home. Mm. That was like their certain keys to, to like, for them that like, Oh, this word means, you know, like when I, when we talk about this idea, like this is the phrase that you can, that that actor connects with. And like that, like common language to where, when like I say blue and you say blue and we're thinking of the same shade of blue, you yeah. know, 
like yeah. I was just curious like did you did you find that that as like a did you find that did was that something that happened yeah I don't know if they if I had like keywords with actors I'm sure I had something with someone I had you know certain little things um but for for our lead, John Paul, who played Jordan Lacey, who, had, you know, at least in the first act, he's this very stressed out, burned out pop star. He just wants to exit. Right. He just wants to get out of his skin. <laughs> he doesn't know where he's, he's he really, truly wants to go. He just wants out. And that whole first act, he just I, I gave him the direction. Like when we talked, you know, between shots, between setups, it was always about it was always just, I talked to him a certain way. I'm like, cause you know, you need to do this, right? This, this is, you need to do this in the scene because you got to do this later. You got to get to Ojai, you know? It, it was just kind of framing our discussions around this sort of like frenetic, you know, you said the word juiced up. I, I think that's his performance again, at least in the first act and kind of, his character kind of chills out once he sort of finds his, his center and his base halfway through the film. But that first act, it's all about, I just need to exit. I need to get out of here. Just need to get out of here. You know, and it was very much like a, you know, the energy in like Wolf of Wall Street. I gave him that, you know, reference, just, you know, what too much Coke, right. And you want to, the, the party's over. You want to get out of the party. Um, you feel trapped in this psychosis, this drug psychosis, and you just want to get out. And so it was just like a certain tone we had like, and I think truly, I think that's kind of the cool thing about, films in general is like each project has a different tone on set because of the nature of the film, right? The nature of the story. Yeah. And yeah, that has a lot to do with style, um, particularly certain relationship dynamics and chemistry between certain characters can kind of set that tone. Um, but I, I don't know how you feel about, I want to ask you this question next. I'll just say with, with Neon Bleed, there's a lot of fond memories because it was just the energy needed to be there. You know, you're talking about like the music industry, high stakes, you know, corruption, crime in Los Angeles. There was just an energy. I think the whole crew felt that was really exciting and, and fun, you know, on that set, because it was just like a fun, you're like making a, making a movie, you know, that's, that's high stakes and you're, you're in LA. So it was really fun. How did you feel the set, the tone on set? Uh, of Hungry Dog Blues was just in general, not even specifically like the tone you set with the actors, but like the crew yeah. as well. Um, I think it was excellent. It was really great. I mean, we shot in October of 2020. So it was like just full height pandemic. And so we were obviously mm. all the precautions and doing all of that. But even with that, people were so excited to be making a movie, especially a St. Louis crew who like doesn't get the opportunity to make movies very often. It's not like LA or New York where these guys are on shows all the time. Like these guys are doing commercials most of the time. And like, so just yeah. the general level of excitement about that was, was just through, you know, people were just pumped to be making a movie. I was pumped to be making, like, it just had this like, you know, almost like camp movie experience you know where like we were all in the middle yeah. of nowhere day after day yeah. you know and, and the weather was beautiful and like we were shooting this movie and it was it was you know in my opinion it's a it's a cool movie we're making a cool movie you know what i mean like it's yeah cool. yeah like they're doing cool movie stuff and like you know it's like it feels exciting in that way and, and i felt like we really from top down tried to, you know, from all of our producers and, and cast and crew and everyone, like we were really, really focused and very diligent. You know, that's kind of, I mean, uh, yeah. our past experiences together, uh, even back to college, like I run a pretty tight ship of things. Like I, you know, and I, <laughs> I, I, I carry with me a pretty, a certain amount of intensity, you know, that I just yeah. can't help. But I was yeah. like, own into like uh not such an abrasive or like uh you know intimidating fashion but just that like you can feel the passion of what i'm doing and like yeah i believe that like a film set works top down you know you, as the director you're you are the pace setter you're the captain you're you know you're you're the one that has to like be having the most fun but also being the most focused you know yeah. and, and understanding that like everyone is going to look to you about 
how to behave, what the style of this movie is. And, you know, I think, yeah. especially, I'll just speak for the, our, our crew and stuff like that. Like it took like two or three days for people to really get like the, get the culture of like, mm -hmm. we're going to be super focused and work really hard, but also mm -hmm. we are not going to lose sight of that. This is the most fun thing, the coolest thing we could play. Yeah. And like that, that is awesome. You know, like to, to not take it too seriously to where you don't understand yeah. you're playing pretend with cameras with your friends in the woods. Right. You know, that, that I felt like was, was the part of it, you know, that I'm really, really proud of is, is by the end of it, you could feel everyone feeling that cohesion and happiness. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, that's what I, I think is like the best, like, and, and I know I talked about it earlier with that sort of like this sort of energy, just the, you, you, you get on the train, the energy takes over and you're not as self-conscious about, yes, you're still, you know, delegating how you should be delegating and communicating as sternly or as laxly as you as you should be but you're not thinking about it you know because there is and i think that is that cohesion of crew cast department heads that that really does happen when everyone syncs up you know you, you sync up to the 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 creative energy of this project and you get used to the rhythm of okay you know, the fires are starting, the problems need to be solved, and people know their roles, and they know how to communicate with each other to, to tackle them. And I, I think that's where, you know, some of the best memories are made when you have this, this is just bizarre problem, you know, that that comes up that you could have never calculated. And you needed to like, take a step back and talk to your DP or talk to your production designer or your UPM, and figure out, okay, how do we how do we get around this? You know, how do we manage this issue that we just didn't see coming you know is it's uh one in particular on neon bleed that's like one of those like decisions that you now when you look back at the film you go oh my gosh i can't believe that i made that right choice right there like i <laughs> that, like we made this second decision and it worked out like that that was like that that was right you know what i mean yeah 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 I, I don't know if I I don't know if there's any one shot that I I feel is like oh that's completely different than how I envisioned it because X Y Z but there is one moment in the film there's a setup that is there's this uh, I don't want to go too long on this story but the long story short is we were filming a, a scene it's actually a, a one one shot a one -er in the film. The camera's in the passenger seat in a Toyota Tacoma, and uh, my wife, actor Giovanna Andalina, who plays Romina, was driving. And the sequence is she gets out of the car, takes Farouk, uh, who is Jordan's friend slash creative director, and she's dropping him off. He's got a bag over his head to be basically released from, you know, the, the party of captors there. And... Um, so we were filming on Topanga Canyon, and this was the last shot of day one, and we were losing light, so it was going to be the last setup, right? And I knew we didn't have it. It was good. It wasn't great. I knew we didn't have it, but and it was it was usable. Um, but again, I, I was like, let's go one more time. Um, so we start to back up, and there's these turnouts on Topanga Canyon, right? And it's very narrow road and there's these select turnouts so we had to kind of coordinate okay we're gonna drive back down to the turnout you know one one turnout down and use this turnout as like the picture turnout where we do the drop off so we get ready to set up to go back to our our one turnout and i just started because i'm in the back of the the bed of the toyota with the monitor right and i start to feel the truck just tip and my freaking flight or fight like flight or flight just death response kicks in and i just start to go whoa 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 park and I, and I start to make a jump like out of the bed because i i feel the truck like just freaking going off the edge of the the canyon and i still get like hot flash like literal like sweat flash moments of that memory where I was like, oh my God, we could have fucking died on that shot. And that was day one. <laughs> that was day one of the production. 
And so whenever I see that shot in the film, I always like turn to G who was driving at the time. And I was like, you could have killed, could have, could have killed us all there. Could have, could have shut down the entire production. Stay. Yeah. That's, that's that. I, mean, I, I, the funny thing is, is I think most of those like gut split second decisions that really pay off are not like, Oh, I thought of that. I would shoot this completely differently than I did, you know, right. Right. ever right. it's like that it's like that on day one yeah. we're in the back of a truck and i had a feeling that something yeah. bad was happening and i listened to it and thus we're all not dead and now there's a movie right? yeah and i i can't even take credit for stopping that uh ashton moyo who plays farouk who was also in the in the truck he's actually a, a stunt a stunt double as well he's in stunts and oh. so he acts and he's in stunts as well so he has these razor sharp instincts Right, and he was the one that was just like, stop, put it in park. And it was like, whoa, if he didn't like just in- initiate that immediately, like who knows? <laughs> but I tried to tell you about it. I was like, cause she was like a wreck after that. And we, you know, sleeping that night after day one, like we didn't know, you know, our AD and our UPM had to talk and it was like, we could have been shut down. Like, you know, cause our AD didn't want to lose his, his DGA status and he felt responsible. So it was like this whole thing, you know, and it was like an extreme moment of adversity that I, when I watch the film, I think about it in that shot being like, oh, that could have been, that could have been the end. You know? Nobody, nobody, and nobody knows. Well, now everyone knows that they watch this discussion, but <laughs> most of those things are invisible. Yeah. And I think that's the cool part of, of movies too. It's like, not only are you capturing the story, but, you know, for the people that make the film, there's so many memories and, and just so much wrapped up in what is the film now, right? When you watch it, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, I want to wrap us up here. It, it was great talking to you. I, I just want to ask, uh, what's what's up next for you? Now that Hungry Dog Blues has been out since April, right? So it's been about four months, almost four months and three months. And, uh, are you thinking about your next project? Do you have a script? Where, where are you at with that stuff? So I'm writing right now. Um, I'm deep in the drafting process. Um, it's going well. I, I'm very happy with it. Um, that being said, you know, these things take a long time. And so I'm like, I'm in the bliss of, of writing where it's all possible and it's all yeah. well. Um, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to be able to make this film and I, it's definitely what I want to do next. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll just, we'll just see how it goes. That's, I'm going to just keep chugging along and, and try and write the best thing that I can and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wish you the best of luck. I, I can't wait to see what you do next. Um, I've always been a big fan of yours since we, we met at good old LMU. I'm and, uh, Likewise. Yeah. I always, yeah. I always appreciate our discussions. I think too, cause you know, we both took a Meisner technique um, two year that for me, I'll speak for myself, like that really opened me up, not only as an actor, but as a, as a writer, even more so than as an actor, but as a writer. Is that like, I, I feel like the training was my writing school. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's always great. Cause I feel like your mind works similar, how you approach story, how obviously as a director, writer, director, um, but, but really keying in on the performances and the character driven nature of storytelling so i'm yeah i'm super excited to see what see what you come up with next likewise likewise uh la- last final note that I'll, I'll say to you though as a do you find in your writing process as you're drafting you have people do repetition with each other like too much i find that- <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i always do like i times. That shows up, yeah that shows up in my drafts is like repetition or the line what does that mean <laughs> you know <laughs> or or in my head as I'm writing you know I'll I'll be on like the next line of dialogue and I'll always go back to like what are they doing how do I feel about it right and trying to write from that place of you know the guttural sort of like invisible thread of triage and, and yeah. emotion and all that so or like 
emergency is another one or, or like an activity like all the time I'll yeah be writing something i'll be like this is two people an activity like what is happening like this they're having a scene about it and i'm like that can't yeah. happen like someone's gotta be needing to get something done here and the right. other right. something else that they need like you know what i mean it's like that very yeah. big stuff is like i'm always yeah just, what, what are they doing? What is their what is their secret thing that they need that they're going after? Because like right now they're just standing mm -hmm. talking about their feelings. Like that's yeah. not good. <laughs> anyway, yeah. no, I mean hands down, and I think because you had DW as well, right? Yeah, yeah, and I, I like he was so great. I felt like it was more an education on dramaturgy than it was any particular style of acting. It was just story structure, it, 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 st structure and and just rules that you would never think are rules but you see them happen in great films and and even theater these these norms the unspoken norms that that sort of codify storytelling in a very interesting way that we don't even think of that's so unconscious but is you know very important you learn because <laughs> you're like why does this scene not work and it's like oh it's a simple thing that people take for granted you know it's just, it's just way of speaking or way of doing or you know whatever so but yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's cool. It's cool to have that as as this sort of well to go back and and draw on to the writing process specifically. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm glad we got to chat. It was really fun talking to you. Me too, Jason. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it's good to see you. And uh, good luck. Good luck with what comes next. Same. Anytime. All right, buddy. Have a good one. Later, bro.